Welcome to this week's episode of Accredited Investor Markets Radio. Each week, we speak with you about investing in alternative assets. Unbiased and beholden to no one, Accredited Investor Markets Radio does not accept advertising from any investment firm or financial advisor. Accredited Investor Markets Radio is the spoken word sister of AccreditedInvestorMarkets.com, the internet's most comprehensive and unbiased educational resource about crowdfunding, angel investing, venture capital, private equity, private shares, and other investment classes beyond publicly traded stocks and bonds. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Accredited Investor Markets Radio. I am your host, Christopher Cahill. You may remember, uh, those of you who are Bruce Springsteen fans, uh, that he made a big splash with the album Wrecking Ball in 2012, supported by a very big concert um, uh, schedule. Uh, and the album and the concerts were very much in the spirit of Occupy Wall Street. He railed against the evil of the 1% and of various corporate malefactors and big anything. Of course, not lost on some listeners is that this was a billionaire singing before audiences with many a senior manager in it having paid $100 a ticket. Not that I begrudge Bruce. Uh, he may be the richest man I've ever seen, but I don't mind him stacking his chips. One might wonder, if one looks back in time, whether he was purging himself of the stain of 2009, at which point he contracted with Walmart, famously, for exclusive rights to sell his 12-song compilation at $10 each. His fans, many of his fans, were quite outraged that he would do such a big deal with Walmart when Walmart was known to have uh, labor issues, to put it mildly. Uh, Bruce assured his outraged fans that, quote, we, end quote, <laughs> were doing a lot of things at once and inadvertently did business with Walmart. Well, all of this came to mind when I read a recent article, uh, September 24th, New York Times piece, uh, entitled, Walmart Prepares to Offer Low-Cost Checking Accounts. The piece was written by Hiroko Tabuchi and Jessica Silver Greenberg. So, Walmart entering the banking business. Well, their intent is to supply checking accounts to almost anyone over 18 who passes an ID check with no fees for overdrafts or bounce checks, no minimum account balance. Well, that sounds pretty good. The accounts will cost $8.95 a month if the direct deposits that are put in it are less than 500 a month. Presumably, I think they're free if you have direct deposits of greater than that amount. GoBank is uh, how the service will be called as part of Walmart's push into financial services for people with little or no access to traditional banking. Now, to every action, there is a reaction. The following day, an article appeared in The Hill, and the article is entitled, Banks Fret Over Walmart's Foray into Checking. And I'll just quote what the article quotes from the president and CEO of the Independent Community Bankers of America. Quote, quote, these accounts should be subject to the same legal and regulatory framework, consumer protections, and oversight as traditional checking accounts offered by banks. Well, okay, this arouses in me the three following observations. Walmart can provide checking? Well, consider that for a minute. There must be banking outside of Citi, JPM, B of A, and Wells Fargo, which is to say, these entities are too big to fail and must be saved, according to some people, by public funds if necessary. Well, let us consider that where the need is present, other entities, non-banks, will be happy to provide, in this case, checking accounts, or in the case of PayPal and Apple, online payment systems. The second observation is that the Hill article quotes a small bank organization brandishing regulatory apparatuses to counter Walmart's attempt to provide better and cheaper services. Usually, small banks are criticizing the regulatory apparatus for favoring large banks, which after all, can gain influence over the regulatory apparatus and uh, more easily absorb the costs of compliance. And in connection with that, I would like to mention a ProPublica article at www.propublica.org, dated September 26th by Jake Bernstein, entitled Inside the New York Fed, Secret Recordings and a Culture Clash. It's a long piece, which has a lot of detail about 
secret recordings made within the New York Fed, uh, which demonstrate that the New York Fed is certainly influenced by the entities it regulates. In this case, Goldman Sachs. There was all kinds of deference extended to Goldman Sachs. The third observation I'd like to make is that in connection with checking accounts, Walmart ends up being for the little guy. After all, well, maybe Bruce doesn't have that much to apologize for uh, for getting in bed with Walmart in 2009. Well, let us move on to the interview because as we say at Accredited Investor Markets Radio, tramps like us, baby, we were born to invest. Thanks, Chris. This is Alicia Purdy, Managing Editor of AccreditedInvestorMarkets.com and your host for this week's broadcast. Sam Houghton of Houghton PA is a business attorney and entrepreneurial consultant. He regularly lectures on private equity, succession planning, crowdfunding, and other business-related topics. His writings have appeared in a number of websites and publications, including Accredited Investor Markets and Seeking Alpha. Welcome, Sam. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Today we're discussing how PE and VC, private equity and venture capital firms, and similar capital raisers may or may not change their behavior in light of Rule 506C, noting that the ban on general solicitation nixed many private equity offerings before they even started. And yet there's been substantial growth in the online AI only, a credit investor only private equity platforms over the past few years. Sam, if you would, please give our audience a brief history of general solicitation, quote unquote, what it is, why it was banned, by whom, what life was like, then what it will be now since the ban was lifted. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's start first by saying that if you offer the sale of securities, either debt or equity in your company then that offering must be registered with the SEC. Now, there are exceptions to that requirement, but that's the general rule. Uh, the most commonly used exception to that rule of having to register the securities or basically go through a public offering was called Regulation D, Rule 506B. The reason people rely on that rule is because there's no requirement to comply with state blue sky laws. So you don't have to go to all the individual states and comply with their blue sky laws. 506B, this, this one that we're talking about now, it does not allow you to generally solicit, uh, meaning that you can't speak to anyone that you already have a substantive relationship with. Uh, in other words, you, you would need to know them uh, financially on a very intimate level to be able to talk to them about uh, investing in your company. And that's, that's what's called generally soliciting. So that would include anything from speaking to the press, um, putting anything online, posting anything on social media, saying we're looking for investors or we're looking for some, some debt to get this new line of business going. And that, that's all considered general solicitation. That is a, a huge problem uh, and that will remove your ability to be able to rely on that exemption that's used the most often, which is 506B. The new Jobs Act, which passed in 2012, and uh, last year the rules were written for Article 2 of that, or Title 2 of that, which is the ban on general solicitation. The removal of the ban on general solicitation removed the ban on general solicitation. So now people can uh, generally solicit, meaning that you, that you can put on Facebook or on Twitter or on your website or speak through the press or speak at events that you're looking for funds to start your business or grow your business. Now, there are requirements that you that you need to meet to be able to utilize that exemption, but it is, it's a much easier way to raise money now that you can generally solicit than not being able to prior. So before the ban, um, what was the consequence if someone tried to step outside of their intimate circle to talk about an offering? The consequence was that they weren't allowed to, to rely on that exemption, and as a result, that offering was counter to FCC rules, and it could potentially be rescinded, uh, meaning that investors would be able to get their money back uh, from the company. Which, in the situations where investors are asking for their money back, the company just does not have the money to give it back. And there's also the FCC rules, security rules, or one of the very few laws in the United States where you have individual liability as well as uh, corporate liability. So there, there's the chance of having some individual liability from the, from the principals to have to pay back the investors. So it's a huge negative to not be able to rely and have that exemption pulled. 
so what do you think, in your opinion, will the lifting of the ban do for um, issuers or capital raisers? The removal of the ban provides the issuers and the capital raisers the ability to, to go directly to investors. So on their Facebook page, on their website, they can put, we are looking for money. We're trying to raise money to be able to, to do business. And right now banks, I mean, even though they're, they're a little bit more flexible in their lending practices, uh, they're still not to the level that they were three, four or five years ago. And so if a business is looking for money, they can put on their website that they're looking for money. Now, there is a requirement that you file a Form D prior to the 506C offering. So I would encourage anybody that's looking to raise money through private equity to speak with their professional about making sure that they're following the rules. But that's what it did. It, it, it made it easier for issuers and capital raisers to raise money because now they can ask people that they don't know uh, and basically advertise the fact that they're looking for money. Um, what about investors? Are they positively, negatively, neutrally affected by this? Because with capital raisers or issuers having more freedom, what does it do for investors, the good, the bad, the ugly? Well, for investors, it's a great thing for investors. It's, um, it provides additional sources of investment for them. So an angel network has a ton of new potential investments. It's increasing the supply to the investors. And so that certainly will increase the number of offerings available, and it could potentially decrease the price to invest in these because, uh, because the market would be a little bit flooded in terms of, of new offerings to those investors. So it's a good thing for investors. Because we'll have so many more quality opportunities, or, or do you suspect it would be just a sheer larger amount of numbers or um, access well, to more quality? Be, well, there will be more. There will be some more that are, that are not good. There will be some more that are great. There's probably the new mix that's added in may be a little bit dirtier than it was prior because it's not as expensive if you're doing it by yourself than if you're using a broker to, to go and find investors. And so the offerings that were in place prior to 506C were probably a little bit more cleaner, more clean. But I don't think the investors are too concerned about that. They can weed through the weeds to be able to come up with some of the diamonds that might not have already been, might not have been there. Uh, so, so far, We've seen some commercials, accredited investor markets actually did an article on, uh, we called it, if you see a television ad for a hedge fund, change the channel. And um, it was sort of a look at the early stages of advertising and, and bringing opportunities or even commercializing one hedge fund or another. So, so hedge funds have kind of come out of the gate slowly. How do you think others uh, in other types of investment vehicles are going to embrace all this? Well, I think that this is going to be a very successful endeavor for businesses that might have been just below the threshold of utilizing private equity in the past. So small businesses, because this is easier. It's an easier track for people to take to, to get investment because they can now reach out through social media. They can reach out through the press on their own websites. Um, and they could have pamphlets at a golf course or, or one of their clubs you know, showing what, what their company is, what they're looking to raise money, how they're looking to raise money, what they're, what they're willing to offer. I just see you know, a jar and loose of the money uh, to be able to invest in these companies, and, and it's it's always a good thing, in my opinion. Okay, great. If I could ask you to make some predictions, kind of the what-ifs that the lifting of the ban will do for business economy, startup community, job creation. That was sort of the whole spark of all of this anyway, was job creation. Can you give me some what-ifs, like maybe this could happen within realistic means? Sure. Now, Angel Networks are going to have basically a farm league of opportunities to choose from. There's The market's going to bear uh, groups, more and more groups that will pop up um, providing seminars, you know, whether you want to call them angel groups or incubator groups or whatever you want to call them. There will be groups of businesses that are looking for funds that will team up together and push it out towards investors in one way or the other, whether that's through social media or whether it's a brick and mortar establishment in a city somewhere and the city maybe wants to sponsor an event where 
local businesses that are looking for money need to be matched up with people who want to invest and so they have something at City Hall or the Civic Center or whatever and um, invite people to come up and, and invest. It's, it's really exciting because there's a lot of uh, uncertainty about how this will all work, but I, I don't think there are very many people who are saying that this is a bad idea. It's just that what, what, they're, what they're saying is how is it going to work. What they're, what they're arguing about is how is it going to work. And the market, the free market's going to determine what the best way is to deal with it. I think it'll take a few years before we really start to accept it as a country. It could confuse the market a little bit at first, and there will likely be people out there saying that, that it has increased fraud. There are case studies from other countries that, are, that have shown that fraud does not, in fact, increase by doing these sort of things, but, but there always will be those naysayers. So, well, in general, I would think anyway that the startup community doing well would increase jobs, which in turn, sort of a circle, which in turn would benefit the, the economy. So e even with the increase in fraud and risk, and, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, in general, it sounds like as it develops and it will continue to develop, it's, it's going to be a good thing overall because new business is always tends to be a good thing anyway. Yeah, I would agree with you. We'll talk about fraud a little bit later, but if you're looking to fraud people, I wouldn't choose 506C because basically what you're doing there is just, it's a general solicitation. So I'd be less concerned about fraud when you're exposing it to the masses than with people who are trying to do 506Bs outside of the press or outside of putting something online because the more exposed you get, you know, the less likely, in my opinion, there is to be fraud. Well, that makes sense. It makes sense that there's more people watching and probably delving in and exploring you. Okay, so I was actually thinking the other day about, I read a statistic once on how the most common commercials you see are car commercials, and I would argue now pharmaceutical commercials as well. I actually am surprised that there aren't more magazine ads and radio spots and television commercials. Um, and the, and the, one of the early hedge fund commercials I just mentioned earlier was only released online. Why aren't more capital raisers just absolutely taking advantage of this brand new approved medium to get the word out there? Well, there's just not a ton of them. And there aren't, there, there isn't a lot of offerings where companies have the money to pay for commercials and newspaper ads. I mean, they're the ones that are looking for money right now anyway, you know, so it's not like they can take out a full page ad in Time Magazine because that costs money and they're looking for money. And so again, this is more to help guys that wouldn't take out the, the newspaper ads, but, but would more likely utilize Facebook and Twitter and, and their websites to, to just, through a friend of a friend, get them connected to the funds. Now that's not to say that there won't be more of those, but I just I think it's less uh, less of a national magazine type of a of an advertisement and more of a local maybe local magazines and and that sort of thing. But um, yeah, these are smaller smaller deals. Well, that's actually a good segue into my next question. We already kind of talked about hedge funds, but in something like private equity or venture capital, which there's some real opportunities in there. Is there a medium that you think will end up being most effective? You just mentioned that local will probably be a focus for sure. Um, as far as medium goes, you've mentioned Facebook, you've mentioned Twitter. Do you think that would be more popular or effective than over another one? Or, or what do you anticipate people will gravitate toward first? I think that the more local mix you can get, uh, the more effective the pitch is going to be. Because typically these investments are funded by people that are local. And this bill will be most advantageous for businesses that uh, used to be just outside of this financing world. So I'm thinking Facebook and social media and uh, on your website and maybe having seminars locally. TV and magazines and that kind of thing, they, they get expensive very quickly and investors need to be able to trust in the company. And 506C is the most I guess that that's where the, the least amount of trust is found in the 506 c transaction because by definition, you're dealing with people that you didn't already know. So uh, that's why I think the local connections probably makes the most sense because they can actually kind of meet the person and, and know who they're investing in. It's less likely for people to, to see an advertisement in a national magazine and then say, well, 
I want to fund that because if that's the case, you should be able to find somebody local to do that as well. Well, let me ask you this. I'm gonna I'm gonna um, speculate for a second here. So, say there was a networking, a friend of a friend type thing. You heard about a deal on on Facebook or Twitter, and it was local. Who gets the finder fee when an investor is solicited through social media? Is there one? Does there have to be one? Um, is someone gonna come looking for it and you know shake you down for it? How would that work? Yeah. No, there's no mandatory finder's fee. It's really what anybody can work out. So that'll be interesting to see how that shakes out. There hasn't been a whole lot of uh, precedent on this 506C side of things. So it'll be interesting to see how the market will, will handle that. I don't know. Okay, fair enough. I'm going to switch topics for a second. I'm going to ask you about some niche areas of investing. What do you think would be the most popular when it comes to general solicitation advertising for an investment opportunity? And by that, I mean, what types of investments do you think would be most amenable to this type of advertising in your experience? Well, like I was saying before, there's always going to be a lack of trust with these 5 or 6 C transactions. And what I mean by that is people don't know each other. So you're not going to trust somebody automatically. So a company with significant assets or collateral that can be used or at least easily valued by an investor would be good, like um, real estate investments. Real estate is one that comes to mind easily because it's easily understood. A lot of times you'll have collateral if it's a debt instrument. Uh, you don't necessarily have to trust the person as much than if you were, you were starting a a marketing company or, or something where there's not a whole lot of assets and, or collateral that's involved in the business. I just want to ask you this. In the piece you wrote for Credit Investor Markets, it was called Will Private Equity Advertise, which was funny. It was really predictive of what we were talking about today. You mentioned that, and I'm just quoting here, businesses will, over the next decade, increasingly view the sale of debt or equity to the private market as an alternative to bank debt financing, end quote. And I thought that was really interesting um, since it was kind of, you know, quasi related to what we're talking about. Uh, why should this matter to an investor or why should they sit and pay attention to this shift away from bank debt financing in all of this? Well, uh, this will come as people, more and more people accept this 506C or even 506B and why investors should, sit, should pay attention to it. I suppose it's because they're going to be the ones that are, that are putting the money into these businesses, and it will come, uh, they'll feel more comfortable over the years. I mean, right now I can understand, you know, you got somebody that comes to you with needing $500,000 to, to build a building that he's going to rent out for some commercial space, and you don't know the person from Adam, but... Uh, after four or five years, and, and you can show the track record of these type of investments working, and if you can spread out your your investments between that one guy who's doing that commercial property and, and another guy who's doing a residential real estate piece and another guy who's starting a brewery in Milwaukee, you start viewing it as a separate asset class. And the businesses, the actual issuers, will see that the uh, that it's effective to raise money. and it would be a lot cheaper in many instances than, have, than going to the bank and, and trying to get a loan through them or through a hard money lender. Uh, and there are plenty of times where the banks say no to, to a certain ideas that are, that are great in and of themselves. They just banks have internal controls that they have to meet and they might need to be a little bit more certain about an investment than, uh, than an investor who's well diversified. Can you talk for a second about the role of online private equity platforms and how they'll evolve given all of this information uh, over the next five or ten years? Sure. Yeah. Right now, the online private equity entities, they've been operating under a couple of different rulings from the uh, SEC and basically giving 60 to 90 day periods where somebody needs to sign up for their service and then only after 60 or 90 days are they able to invest. This will likely, if they embrace it, they can sign people up and those people can start investing as soon as they become uh, certified as accredited. And that's another thing we need to point out here is that under 506C transactions, all the investors need to be what's called accredited investors. They actually, the FCC is looking at whether they need to increase the standard right now on that. but. So once these online sites can verify that the person's accredited, uh, they might be able to invest automatically. 
And as this, as the years go by and people, these asset classes as, as more and more uh, applicable to their situation or practical to them, those, I see those sites significantly expanding as a result of this. Okay. Um, what about fraud and due diligence? We had mentioned earlier fraud. And we didn't really touch on it because we wanted to spend some time here. What about fraud and due diligence? I mean, I, obviously, we, we mentioned there would be an increased risk proportionally to the increase in deals that would come out. How does that work? And, and let me just give you a series of questions and we can take our time through them. Fraud and due diligence. Um, is there anyone beside the investor when, when these deals start getting advertised for vetting deals? Who regulates advertisements? You know, if there's a television ad, you know, the FCC regulates them for hair gel and vitamins to make sure that they're not fraudulently being put out on television. However, who's going to be doing all of that with advertisements that are for opportunities if it ever comes to the point where they're you know, broadcast on television, for example. Well, sure. Yeah, I, I would r recommend heavily to anybody who's investing in one of these deals uh, or any private equity deal to do their own due diligence and ask questions of the of the business and ask difficult questions and see how the uh, issuers respond. Because you're basically you're investing in people at this level. This is a very early stage investing, and uh, you need to know that the, the people you're investing in know what they're doing and will work hard and will respond well to you. Those are very important things. Now, from a fraud perspective, like I was saying before, five or six C transactions, uh, which are general solicitation, if I were a guy trying to be a fraudster, I would not choose five or six C because, uh, it's, again, it's public. It's very public. Here's what I'm selling. Just by the sheer number or volume of of an increase in private equity transactions, you, you might have a, an increase in fraudulent activity, but I think percentage-wise, it's going to be lower commensurate with the number of deals than it was prior, because I think you're going to have less fraud in 506 C transactions than you do with 506 B transactions. Did that answer the question? Yeah, no, it did, and, and I think the best advice always is that an investor needs to play the largest role in vetting deals, of course. I was thinking about, like I said, about television or magazine ads being, you know, regulated. You know, the FCC, you can't allow certain images after a certain time, you know, of day, and you can't, you know, swear during the family hours, that sort of thing. And they're pretty tight on that. And I was wondering for our audience, you know, how can they know, do, even though they're responsible ultimately for their own due diligence, is there someone else watching? These 506 C transactions are still governed by the same anti-fraud rules as 506 B, which means okay. you have to disclose all materially relevant facts to the investors. And that basically includes a private placement memorandum anytime you want to issue some, some debt or equity through 506 B or through 506 C, uh, explaining all of the risks that are known to you, all of the, anything that's related to the issuer's business that an investor would reasonably be expected to want to know. And if you don't do that, then the investor can come back at you and file for rescission. And the issuers are, are in a very difficult situation. So anybody looking to, needs to hire a securities attorney to have them make for them a private placement memorandum and be sure that they file the necessary filings with the, with the SEC prior to when they start looking for money. So not after they've received money, but prior to when they're starting to look for money. And that just needs to be a line item in their budget to pay for experts to help them put that stuff together. I imagine a commercial, sort of like the pharmaceutical commercial where there's, you know, a beautiful couple looking really happy, and then at the bottom it'll say, or in, in really fast talking, it'll say something like, you know, side effects include loss of life, death. <laughs> you know, and you're like, oh, that seems counterintuitive to what I'm actually seeing you know, on, on TV to realize people like to, to overlook the risk when really it's it's very real and it could be very real. If they're not careful, they're not making themselves aware. Does that sound accurate? Yes. Uh, now, there are additional rules uh, for the 506C offerings that are proposed right now by the SEC, and one of those rules is a list of disclaimers that needs to be included on pretty much any kind of communication. And that's sounds very similar to what you're talking about with the, with the disclosure of the, the medical conditions. And if that ever goes through, it's going to be a real hit for Twitter, too, because you, know, you, don't have, 
you don't have a whole lot of space to put right. um, disclaimers in there. But they're wrestling with the rules right now with pretty much all of the Jobs Act. And actually, this article or this Title II is really the only part of the Jobs Act that's actually done or expected to do any good right now. But yeah, that's that's a significant concern. I mean, when you're trying to get investors, you, you can advertise. I mean, you don't have to say anything and everything about your investment during the advertisement, but you do have to say anything and everything about your investment prior to when they send you their money. Sort of like the, the advertisement tells them about the deal. Once they talk to you, you need to get to them a prospectus or a private placement memorandum explaining everything, uh, and then they'll sign something saying that they agree that to and that they understand everything that's in the documents that you've given to them. And that should be prior to their uh, investing in your company. Okay, so you've noted before in one of our pre-podcast sort of discussions via email that there have been substantial growth in the online accredited investor only private equity platforms over the past few years and now, you know, that the lifting of the ban, probably even more so. What had been causing the substantial growth up until that point, though? I, I would just attribute that to more and more trust through the Internet. I mean, from banking transactions to, you know, any people are just more and more familiar with the Internet and more and more comfortable with sharing information and understanding that, that the truth is going to come out. So when you're buying something online nowadays, I mean, you look at the comments section. You know, which people rate this as five star. I usually look at like the five stars or the four stars, and I also look at the one stars and to see you know what people that had a bad experience with the product, what their problem was with it, and then the people with good experience. I want to I want to hear that as well. Well, that's the hope for 506C and for crowdfunding in general. We, we haven't really spoken about crowdfunding, but once you uh, you get people online and they start talking about a deal more information comes out than what would normally come out in a situation where you don't have an online presence. So the old 506D transactions, you know, how they happen and how they've happened is you've got a guy who knows a guy and you send him over a prospectus and, and then you sit down and talk for a little bit and, and that's how they, they get done. With the 506C and, and how I see the future going in terms of the online uh, site, there's more and more interaction between the potential investors to, Oh, well, have you looked at this? Did you see their numbers from two years ago? How are they gonna How are they gonna come up with that if they, you know, do this? And just the the whole uh, going back and forth between the investors and and maybe even likely uh, having the issuers involved and being able to respond to those questions. It's it's a more efficient system that makes more deals, that makes better deals, and that makes more intelligent deals. Okay. To wrap things up for our listeners, um, we've been talking about private equity and, and venture capital and possibly changing behavior, how that will change in, in light of 506C. What's next? Well, hopefully it, it will be this new asset class actually takes hold and there's more and more real markets around the country and there's more and more interaction between investors. You know, I hope that financial analysts and, and financial advisors will get more involved with this asset class because you know I do see that financial advisors are um, are compensated by mutual fund companies and those sort of organizations and so that makes it a little bit more difficult for them to be able to reach out and to get into these uh, ancillary markets but it really is the type of, a, of an asset class that if you if you want to be completely diversified, you need to be in into some of these very early stage startup companies. So hopefully it's a it's more acceptance by the general public, and over the next five to ten years, it, it becomes a real a real investment vehicle for the common person here in America. And I think you know long term we're going to move. There's less and less people that are required to do the duties that, that you know as the years go by. So there's less people that are that are required to make things and less people that are required to perform services. I personally see our economy becoming more of a own your own business type of an economy, entrepreneurial type of an economy than working for someone else type of an economy. And the more businesses we can get started, the more people we can get to invest in them, 
people control their own destiny. They own their own business. They they work for themselves. I, I see that as the future of America rather than rather than working for a, a large corporation and relying on someone else for your paycheck. Well, that's a great way to put it. And actually, that's a great way to um, conclude our discussion, Sam. Uh, thank you for taking the time to speak with Accredited Investor Markets Radio today. I, I enjoyed our discussion. And, and every time when you've written and now we've spoken, I found it very informative. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, listeners can find educational commentary, as mentioned earlier, from Mr. Houghton and other relevant information at www.houghtonpa.com. Uh, you've been listening to Accredit Investor Markets Radio, a weekly podcast devoted to educating investors about the basics of investing in alternative assets. We hope you tune in next week. I'm your host, Alicia Purdy, and we'll talk soon. Thank you for joining us. If you enjoyed this episode, you can subscribe through iTunes or Stitcher, or you can download our app from Libsyn. You can also listen right on our website, www.aimkts.com. Each week, Accredited Investor Markets Radio brings you news and education about investing with a focus on alternative assets. To see a short written summary of this episode, go to www.aimkts.com. Accredited Investor Markets Radio is a production of Financial Poise Radio Productions, LLC.